very much. Howdy, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Most likely, everybody. Everybody, if you can't, if you can't hear me, let me know. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so, uh, like Jesse said, thanks, Jesse. Uh, my name is Frank Evans. I'm here today to talk to you guys uh, about machine learning. I pointed up there like there was going to be a slide. There's not yet. Um, I'm here today to, uh, to talk to you guys about machine learning, which is really apropos for uh, being the, the launch off speech of a web development conference, a topic that doesn't really have anything to do with web development ostensibly, although I'm going to try to convince you today that it actually has a lot to do uh, with web development and particularly in, uh, of tech development and, and tech in general. That even if you're not specifically in this sort of so-called data science type space, you should really be interested in, in, in using machine learning and, and because of the incredible power that the tools um, uh, can give you. Uh, I also want to say I am, uh, before I even start talking about the content, I'm entirely cognizant of the fact that as soon as I stop talking, you guys get lunch. Uh, that, that is not lost on me. Uh, I think it's pretty good. Jesse, what is it? Lobster, is that right? Is that what it's for lunch today? Or is it lobster only for the speakers? Is that what it, okay, okay. Lobster only for, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You guys get bagels, I guess. Um, Anyway, but I want to start talking to you guys uh, a little bit about uh, machine learning. And, and in this area, I want to talk kind of from two perspectives. I want to talk sort of from uh, an applied perspective. Can you guys see what's on my screen up there? Anybody? Anybody see a little? You can. Or do you just see? You can see the back of my screen. It's not as interesting. There we go. Hey, look at that. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about four, uh, kind of two different uh, main perspectives uh, to look at machine learning. It's kind of from an intuition a standpoint, and then I want to get a little bit more uh, into the specific tools where you kind of feel like you have a toolbox that you can work with. I also want to spark a little bit if somebody's really interested in going beyond using machine learning in some type of program or some type of, uh, of application that you're writing or some type of project that you're doing uh, where you can actually start to sort of invent your own and, and modify uh, some of the existing frameworks. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is uh, machine learning and, and, and sort of the, the little larger perspectives, uh, uh, what's kind of become known as, as data science in, in general. Uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, kind of methodology and frameworks uh, and, and basis for thinking uh, about these types of problems. I'm going to talk a little bit about tools. We're here at a tech conference. It wouldn't be a tech conference if we didn't get to argue uh, needlessly about tools. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit specifically more about machine learning from a, uh, a, a standpoint of understanding fundamentally what's happening. That, that is really the, the trick. Machine learning, you, you instantly get thrown into, too commonly, uh, into highly technical, well, you've got to do this, and, 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 and into code, and you should be a long ways into machine machine learning where fundamentally understanding uh, what types of problems and how to shape problems in ways that machine learning has really powerful frameworks and capabilities for solving. That's the real trick. That's the real getting from zero to one of machine learning. Doing the high performance, writing out all, all of the code is, is kind of a secondary nature behind fundamentally understanding how to, to form data science problems. So we're going to start a little bit first with what is machine learning and particularly in, in a little bit larger sense, uh, what is data science and how does machine learning sort of fit inside of an analytical process? There's two, um, there's two kind of quotes that I, I love to use, one serious and one not, see if you can spot which one is which. A data scientist is a data analyst that lives in California. Uh, or the other one that I, actually, I, I, I dearly love is a data scientist is a better mathematician than any of the programmers and a better programmer than any of the mathematicians. I, I stand before you guys who decided to come to a tech conference because most of you, I guess, are probably developers or programmers in some perspective. Anybody, like the vast majority of you probably are. I am probably the weakest programmer in the room. I also happen to be the loudest. That's why they gave me the microphone, I think. But I happen to be the weakest programmer, most likely in the room. Um, but I, I probably am a better mathematician than everybody but Brian. Um, Brian, didn't even, Brian, you didn't even look up at me when I said that. <laughs> uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about kind of a framework for thinking of data science processes. And a famous, uh, probably, uh, arguably, one of the one or two most famous data scientists uh, ha came up with a, a framework she referred to as awesome. I promise you that is supposed to be pronounced awesome. Uh, it's worth noting, especially since we're coming right off of the women in, uh, in technology uh, panel, uh, that it was a female. Her name was, uh, it still is, Hillary Mason. Uh, is an incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, talented uh, data scientist 
and, um, and, and is a huge inspiration to, to this kind of field and has created a lot of the frameworks of how to systematically think about problems in, in this type of pipeline and in an analytical framework uh, that heavily uses machine learning as probably its single uh, largest component. So OS, E, M, N. Uh, o is obtained. First of all, you have to get some data from whatever perspective that is. So that's going to be from a database, from an API, from a flat file, data you just have lying around, data you physically put in. If you have an application and it's running stuff over to Google Analytics or one of the other things that are similar, uh, your application is going to uh, create data. Whatever object you create with your Raspberry Pi is going to create data. That's probably the reason you created it. it. In some perspective, there's going to be a huge amount of data. And as data moves away from people creating it physically and into programs and devices creating it programmatically, the amount of data available and the places where data is available just explode off the charts. And so the opportunities for being able to do something better, know something better than somebody else with your data, uh, it, it just ex it expands exponentially. Next is Scrub. So anybody who's ever worked with data knows that it never shows up nice and clean. Uh, it always shows up all kinds of crazy. Anybody who ever tried to uh, integrate any data that you get from a government agency uh, knows this all too well. Um, so you're going to spend a lot of time uh, scrubbing the data, getting it from its raw form into a place where it is going to be useful to uh, uh, it's going to be useful to some type of machine learning process or some type of analytical process. Uh, at that point, once we've got kind of clean data, we need to figure out as humans what it's about. And this is uh, what's usually referred to as exploratory analysis or just exploration. We as people need to figure out what is fundamentally uh, going on with the data that we're going to be uh, looking at so that we know what could it tell us. What is it capable of, uh, of telling us? What type of, of uh, machine learning frameworks, analytical frameworks, just what type of tech? Do I maybe just want an average of these? Like what type of thing do I want to analytically extract from this data? And to do that, uh, we kind of need to ourselves understand. This gets forgotten way too often. People automatically like to go from the scrub stage, well, I got nice and clean data, let's go directly to making the model so I can go home this afternoon. And they, they forget about trying to fundamentally understand what's going on in their data and how does that match up with the problem, what I want to know about uh, the world. Then comes the modeling stage. It's, even though it's one of five, it's probably the most fun. It's the one we're going to spend the majority of the time talking about uh, this morning. Uh, but it's the one that, that is the most interesting. Everything from the simplest, give me an average of those numbers, look for outliers, all the way up to the most complex, I want to build a crazy neural network that spans three continents type. Uh, so all of it is, is, is going to fit in this process. Uh, and it's going to be informed both by our data, which often gets remembered, but also by our intuition and what we want to know about the world. Uh, based on, on that data. And then the last part is interpret. Uh, and interpret is communicating that finding, whatever knowledge it was that got gained during your process, being able to interpret it out to the world. Now, this always gets talked about in terms of data science. It almost never gets talked about in terms of machine learning. I'm actually going to talk about it as a component of machine learning because I think for those of you who are interested more in the application and web development space, we really need you and would love to have your perspective and ability to communicate interactively with the world uh, the data and, and the things that you find uh, from that data. And being able to effectively do that is incredibly important. And as you'll see, uh, sometimes that means data visualization. That's the most common way. Sometimes it just means literal action based on data, kind of old school, boring, but still highly effective reporting. And sometimes it literally means being able to communicate the findings of your results as data onto another uh, one of these processes that's going to go further, combine it with other things, and, and do answer larger and larger questions um, based, based on that. Uh, so we get to talk about tools. Everybody likes to talk about tools. I'm sure there's a ton of uh, people in here that are, uh, that are JavaScript based. That's why I really want to spend the time uh, talking uh, not about JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I, wanted, I want to make a quick distinction uh, before I do. I, I forgot that I switched the order on these it was just uh, right before I came in. Um, is I want to make a quick distinction of, of who is going to be uh, reading what you're, you're writing. So this is, makes the point between data visualization and where you're going to be communicating your results onto another uh, onto another. 
um, uh, framework in the future. Now, we get to talk about tools. Okay, let's we'll finally get to talk about uh, tools. Being big fans of, of uh, JavaScript, like I said, we get to talk about R and Python. Um, is anybody here an R or a Python programmer by chance? Way more than I expected, so four, okay. Um, this is, this is going to be all R? No, of course not all R, all Python, I know. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about R and Python. Now, you, these are by no even infinitesimal stretch of the imagination uh, the only things that you do data science in. These are largely the ones where uh, data science and machine learning in general are the most mature and hence also uh, the easiest to get started with. You can, get, uh, you can also get started in, in a number of other places if you're a Java person or a C++ or, or anything kind of from the C family. If you're a Scala person, if you're a JavaScript person, they'll probably... Uh, kick me out of, 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 the, of the group for saying this, but you can even do it in, in JavaScript if you want to. Um, but you can, and, and even APIs, there's a ton of APIs out there that, uh, that will respond the way you would expect like a REST style API uh, to respond that will do these types of things. But you still have to fundamentally understand uh, the concepts, and so we're going to spend more time on that than anything else. The two perspectives and one of these is probably going to apply to this audience more than the, the than the you know just the the general uh, group of, of technical minded people, but the the general uh, uh, the two kind of uh, perspectives that uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, one is um, somebody who is coming from a mathematical and analytic background and doesn't have a lot of experience in programming wants to apply what they know from a mathematic and analytic perspective into uh, machine learning, and in that case, and into just data science in general, but specifically to use programmatic tools to emphasize and to better uh, accomplish what they understand, you know, from from their analytic background. And in that case, uh, the, the the perspective that I usually uh, come from and, and very very highly recommend is R. That's probably not a lot of people here in this group, and so from the other perspective, if you come from a programming background, you fundamentally understand the basic concepts of software engineering engineering, and you're kind of headed toward the mathematical and analytic uh, perspective, then the one that gives you the most bang for your buck right off, right out of the door is, is Python. If you happen to be a JavaScript person, which I know a ton of people here are, uh, don't be scared of Python. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of copy script, but better, but like not, if you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's it, 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 they're, they're cousins, so like 90% of the things are basically the same. You just have to look up what the function is called, but, it's, but it works basically the same way. And, and I'd really um, uh, emphasize that you, 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 should, you should want to get into that because I think that's a fantastic uh, way to go. If you're coming from programming, if you want to start using your programming knowledge and your way of thinking to, uh, to do more analytic uh, type things. Now, let's go a little bit deeper uh, into the machine learning uh, uh, itself and into uh, some of the perspectives um, behind that. The basis behind machine learning, why machine learning is valuable, why it's useful, why it is, um, why it's something that we kind of need as data gets bigger and bigger, as it gets faster, we have data that can come milliseconds after whatever event actually happened. Uh, as that happens, we've got one huge problem that likes to stand in the way, and that's us. Uh, we are slow, we are slow, dumb meatbags who can't do math very well at all, and, and for some types of operations, algorithms can do things uh, billions of times before we can ask what it was we were supposed to do in the first place. And so in those types of problems, in those types of perspectives, we end up with this idea data is huge. There's massive amounts of, uh, of data out there uh, available about almost anything you can imagine. People are expensive. We, you know, we, you guys know, you cash the checks every Friday just like I do. We are, are comparatively expensive for what we can produce in a certain amount of time just on our own without any tools. Uh, but computation is getting cheaper. Uh, every year, computation, you get, uh, you know, uh, what is it, every 18 months, you get twice as much uh, for, for the same uh, amount of price, the kind of Moore's Law approach. And so as that happens, you want to be able to use these, uh, these tools. And so what data, uh, sorry, what machine learning um, actually ends up being is we're going to use applied statistics, which is not as scary as it sounds. We're going to use applied statistics to let the computers program themselves, to find 
uh, what we would have to go physically find and, and, and if we were programming these things ourselves. We're going to teach the computer how to judge its own activity and how to cycle through its own activity using applied statistics as our criteria uh, to get them to program themselves. So, uh, machine learning largely fits into three kind of uh, basic types, three kind of basic archetypes of what type of problem you're trying to solve, and then we'll go into domains from there. Uh, the first type is, is referred to as supervised. So supervised is where I have a number of pieces of data, and I have the answer for those pieces of data. And then I want to learn an abstract pattern from those places where I have the answer, and that way when I have new pieces of data coming in where I don't have the answer, I can make the best possible guess of what the answer would be, and to some I, I can figure out maybe what a price on a house is. I have hundreds and thousands of examples of square footage and the year it was built and the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms. I have all of these aspects about all of these houses. I know how much they sold for, and I've got a new house that just came on the market. Uh, and I want to figure out what should it sell for based on all of the things it has. I want to make the best possible guess so that if, you know, maybe uh, if it's selling for less than what it should be worth, I want to go buy it. If it's selling for more than it should be worth, I, I want to uh, steer clear. So supervised learning, where, where we uh, as people are, are supervising uh, what is going to be a correct answer. If you've got supervised, you've got to have unsupervised. So unsupervised it's where we don't have uh, any correct answers. We just have data. And there's tons and tons and tons of data out there where it has never actually been labeled. It's never actually been shown. What was the outcome? What's the answer to the question I'm trying to figure out with this example? I just have tons of data out there without any answers. And I'm trying to figure out not what is the answer, but I'm trying to figure out how are some of these things similar? How do I take a billion examples and say a billion is way too many examples for me to ever figure out what the patterns are for all of them? But maybe if they kind of are similar in six different places, I can figure out what's unique about these six that they all seem to be really similar to each other that's way different than some of these others. And I, and I start to figure out uh, a pattern that has interest to me to, to find out more information, but which I don't already have uh, the answer for any example of. The third type is called reinforcement. So reinforcement is I'm going to start with uh, knowing a specific thing right now. And as new data comes in, I'm going to alter just ever so slightly, tick by tick, I'm going to alter what I know so that I have more information so that I better am aligned with the information that I have seen the most recently. This should be near and dear to our hearts. This is how most of us learned as, as small children. And so out of all three of those, uh, there is a massive amount of data about unsupervised and reinforcement. You can find easily massive amounts of, of data about those for free. You probably, in, in, in whatever roles you happen to have, have lots of opportunity uh, to work with that. However, uh, those are the least mature fields. So we're going to talk about supervised first uh, by a very large margin, the most uh, uh, well-defined uh, field in, in, in this area. So supervised learning. Supervised learning, we have kind of two archetypes of problems that we want to fit something into. Uh, one is referred to as regression, the other in classification. Regression is I want to use continuous data to make a guess about something that exists on a continuous scale so that when I have new data, I can make the best possible guess. I'm going to come back to my housing uh, example. I have a number of houses. I have all of these facts about the houses, how big they are, how many bathrooms they have, how many bedrooms they have, how big the lawn is, what kind of garage it has, all these different types of, of pieces of data. But a house price can exist basically on any scale. You have houses that cost $10,000. You have houses that cost dozens of millions of dollars. And so you have this continuous scale. And you want to figure out where on this scale do I expect this price to be. I have a continuous, uh, I want to build a continuous model that's going to make the best possible guess given an outcome that I expect to exist somewhere on a plane. 
I want to compare that against classification. So classification, I have a number of pieces of data, but they are going to fit in some type of category. Maybe there's two, maybe there's five, maybe there's a hundred categories. The canonical example that is a great place to start with this is trying to figure out if a given email that you receive is spam or not. I have a big data set from the past. I have a bunch that say, this is spam, this is spam, this is spam, this one's not, this is, this is not. And so I know the answer for a number of, of pieces. I can supervise the learning process. But I want to go through, as each new message comes into my email, and I want to be able to tell based on what types of words it uses, how it comes in, when it comes in, how often it comes in between different accounts. I want to figure out, is this likely to be spam or not? And so I'm not looking at something on a continuous scale. I'm looking at something uh, in a classification. I'm trying to figure out which one of these uh, categories does it fit into uh, with, with new data. Unsupervised learning, I don't get any of that for free, which is too bad, but it also opens us up to uh, a massively larger amount uh, of, of data to, to be able to work with. So I want you to start and think about just this first uh, piece over here on the far left. That's the raw data that we have. Now, our eyes are incredibly good at finding patterns. That's why we didn't all get eaten by tigers and bears 10,000 years ago. We are incredibly good at instantly finding patterns. And so we want to be able to systematically do that same thing in a measurable way. Um, and so I look at, at this, and I immediately start to see, well, some of those points are really close together. Some of them kind of seem semi-randomly scattered. And so I'm going to start going through a test. This is kind of middle uh, piece there. I'm going to go through a test, and I'm going to look for uh, all of these groupings. If I started grouping pairs and, and groups of these points together, uh, do they appear like they systematically are closest? Are they, are they closer to their neighbors than the average point is, or are they further away? And as they're closer, as I start to kind of look at this from a density kind of perspective, uh, I can teach an algorithm to look and see, well, I've got, look at this blue, I've got this blue, uh, I'm going to call that a cluster, I've got this blue cluster. I don't know a ton about what is in that blue cluster yet. I don't know what it represents, I don't know why it's clustered together yet, but I do know that those points that are almost on top of each other inside that blue cluster, and there being a, a lot of them there, that sure seems like there's something more interesting about whatever landed those points in that blue cluster than maybe just one of those black points out in the out the, in kind of in the middle of, of random space. And the same thing with kind of the pink and the red and that orange. And now I have reduced from what would be me tracking down how did these points get here for what is probably 1,500 points uh, down to now I'm really asking five or six kind of questions all within one archetype. And I've reduced the problem to where I can better take advantage of either maybe another process uh, later down um, where I, uh, you know, where I can I can train a, a supervised model later on. I can communicate the results of this on down, or uh, you know maybe something where I'm going to physically go through and, and and now I've got it within the scope of human intuition. I can take advantage of of my own intuition because I've got the time to now. Reinforcement learning. I said that's the way we all learned as, as kids. It's the least mature. Uh, of these fields, but it's the one that's been getting a lot of press lately, and, and one of the most famous examples that has come within, I think, the past maybe 18 months, 12 months, I don't remember how long ago it was, was AlphaGo. Um, and so AlphaGo didn't have the ability um, to know everywhere that it's possible, uh, every state that it's possible for a Go board uh, to be in. There are more possibility possibilities in the current state of a game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. And so we didn't have enough computing space to be able to store uh, all the different possibilities. So we couldn't learn that way. Uh, the, the, you know, we couldn't learn by memorizing. We also couldn't learn necessarily just by looking at all of the past games, although that was a component of what they did, uh, because if there are an infinite number of possible games, and I look at all the ones that have ever happened, there's a pretty good chance that pretty early on I'm not going to know what's happening because I've never seen that example before. And I've never seen one that's sufficiently close to that example to be able to uh, understand uh, what is fundamentally going on. 
And so what it did is that it would learn these kind of base patterns, these very, very small level patterns. And it would learn those patterns individually. And then as more data came in, it would try to refit all those to new patterns. And it would shift what it knew based entirely on the current state of what it was in and what was pos- where it was possible to go in these small patterns from that current state. Um, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a, a deep learning. So deep learning, uh, it, it doesn't fit neatly into any of those three. It's, it's used heavily uh, in all three. But it's, it's a hot enough topic. It's, it's an important enough topic in uh, um, understanding what is machine learning and understand what is kind of the, the leading edge of the sort of machine learning. It has a ton of interest out there. And so I kind of wanted to talk about it sort of as a phantom fourth uh, area uh, so that you kind of fundamentally understand what's going on with deep learning. So deep learning and, and the more general term for, uh, for the framework uh, is called neural networks. And it's named that because it is attempting to recreate what actually happens in our brains. And so I want you to think of every single uh, one of these little dots I want you to think of each one of these dots as just a, a tiny uh, program. It's a tiny piece of, of, of uh, uh, data, or it's a tiny piece of programming uh, that's been replicated over and over again. And each one of them knows only its current state and who it's connected to, who it's allowed to send messages to. And so it's going to, at each stage, it's going to know, all right, my current number, I'm, I am one of these little dots called a perceptron. I am one of these little dots. My current number is... Six. If I see a number greater than 10, I'm going to send that message out to everybody who is downstream from me, and then I'm going to wait for further instructions. I'm going to send it to everybody, all all the perceptrons that I'm allowed to send messages to. I'm going to send, hey, I fired. I, I got what I wanted. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen for everybody who's allowed to talk to me uh, to send me a message. And I've got 10 people that are going to send me a message, and I'm going to count a one for every one of those 10 that does. And if, if five do, well, that's only five. I don't fire until I hit six. But if seven do, yeah, that's more than six. I'm going to fire my message on. And by repeating that hundreds and thousands and millions of, of times, it starts to replicate the way that, uh, that we learn and the way that our mind, uh, our brain actually functions uh, such that we can put uh, data in the, the beginning, we can figure out what do we want to see from the other end, and then we can adjust those numbers. You used to be a six, you're a four now. Let's see if that improved you. And we can make those changes piece by piece. We can go through, see how close we got to the answer, and then we can just walk backward and say, you know, if you'd have done this, you'd have gotten closer to the answer here. If you'd have done this, you'd have told him what he needed to be closer to the answer. And we're going to walk all the way back to the beginning and do that hundreds of thousands of times, and eventually we're going to teach every single one of these little neurons just enough to recognize the one infinitesimal part of the pattern that they need to know in order to successfully work as a whole, to work as as a collective, uh, to to give us incredibly complex answers. Uh, You've also used this on, on, well, you used to use this on a daily basis. We don't as much anymore with the U.S. Postal Service. One of the most famous examples of this being applied, I think it was in the 60s maybe, uh, when when this was late 60s, maybe early 70s, was uh, trying to figure out what are the five numbers that got written last on a letter. Anybody remember letters? <laughs> anybody, anybody, write, anybody written a letter in the past five years? No, no, one guy, one, or one, one, one woman. Um, yeah, trying to figure out what are those five numbers that were written on the letter so that they can sort it in the right place. And what they did was they would take a little tiny picture of it, and it would have pixels, and they would put those pixels into uh, those neurons and then with those neurons, uh, they could tell, oh, you know, based on if, if, if I'm lit up right here and this, you know, this one's lit up down here, like that's, that's a seven. That's the type of pattern. Everybody said, yeah, I've, I've, I've got, I've got, I'm recognizing that kind of top part of the seven. That's my job. And that guy over there, he's recognizing like the left part of the seven. Everybody's recognizing all these, these neurons are firing when they recognize what they've been trained uh, to, to recognize over numbers of iterations. And now I can send a letter in there, I can take a picture of it, and it can instantly tell me what is that five-digit number. Uh, and it can automatically route and, and uh, uh, route that letter. 
Um, this is the exact same thing that is being done for things like AlphaGo. It's not looking for patterns of letters. It's looking for patterns uh, of numbers. Um, um, it's looking for pattern. I'm sorry, not, not patterns of numbers. It's looking for patterns uh, of, of Go positions. Uh, if you happen to be, if you happen to be like me, and you really want one of those Tesla self-driving cars, if you happen to be luckier than me and you have one, I'm available for rides after this. But if you happen to be like me and you really want one of those Tesla self-driving cars, that's how they are doing what they're doing. They're bringing in all of their information. They have millions of miles. I think at last time they published about it, they had about 16 million miles worth of data. And every time your car moves one centimeter forward in space, it is evaluating what it's learned by the 16 million miles that every single Tesla has ever driven that they've recorded the data from. And any time they publish new data, any time that they publish a new software update, they will test it by redriving a virtual car 16 million miles uh, before it ever gets to drive its first physical mile around a test track. Um, and so that is, is, is the fundamental nature of what's going on with, with, with deep learning to, to understand it. What deep learning is about, and really what machine learning in general is all about, is about generalization instead of memorization. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to generalize problems rather than just memorize a certain type of solution. And, and I'll tell you why, uh, it'll come up why that is important uh, very quickly. I want you to look at this, um, this classification. Now I've got two possibilities. I've got a black line and I've got a green line. And I'm trying to successfully tell where should I expect to see uh, blue. If I see dots come in, where are they blue? That's one category and where are they red? That's another category. Um, now should I use, do you think, should I use the green line as my, say, as my boundary to say, well yeah, that's the pattern. Because the green line got every single one of them right. If you look, green line did not miss a single one. It learned every single, it memorized every single uh, piece of data that it was given perfectly. And it found this boundary that says, yep, if I'm on this side of the green line, I'm blue. If I'm on that side of the green line, uh, I'm red. But then I want you to look at the black line. Well, the black line is far simpler, and it feels, as we look at it, a lot more intuitive. And so this is kind of the difference between a, a generalization. The black line is a good example of a generalization. It's understanding, it is learning something about uh, the world rather than just something about the data. This is called overfitting. I'm not going to jump into this very far uh, other than to just kind of put it on your, your radar uh, to, to understand the basis of, uh, of what's going on. If you get to the point where machines are really, really good at dealing with tons of data, dealing with tons of details, tons of nuance, and if you don't help it back off a little bit, the first thing it will try to do is just memorize everything. Hey, I got them all right. There we go. That's, you wanted me to get as many as possible right? I got 100% right. What do you think of my green line? Instead, what you want to lean toward is how do I maybe make it a little dumber? <laughs> maybe it's not a great term, but it's... Not a bad one either. How do I back it off uh, just a little bit so that I understand the general pattern of what is going on rather than focusing entirely on the specific pattern that just happens to be this data that I have in front of my face or in front of my circuits. I don't know what the in front of my face version for algorithms is. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about domains. So every single one of these um, uh, types of machine learning. I already have the answers. I want to I wanna find out what the answer will be for the future. I don't have the answers, but I want to pare the problem down uh, to, uh, to where it's, it's uh, something that I can understand unsupervised. Or I know something right now. I want to take in new data as it comes in and make sure that my learning is always sufficiently up to date as new things change. Uh, reinforcement learning. I want to take this into some domains, because there's, there's an idea that, uh, you know, it's common, it's easy. Every single example I gave is what I would refer to as tabular data. Data that theoretically you could envision could fit in Excel. I've got a bunch of rows. Each row is one piece of data. I've got a bunch of columns. Each column is some aspect of what I know about that data. Uh, back to my housing example, each row is a house. Each column maybe is the square footage and the size of the garage and all of these different attributes or features uh, about the piece of data. And so the most common data that you will see is tabular, but it's not the most common you could have access to um, and, and that you could fit these same type of problems, that you could frame uh, of what you're looking at in these same types of problems with. The second one is text data. 
So text data is, by its nature, very messy. It's really easy for us. We can read a piece of text and fundamentally understand what's going on. We can understand all the nuances of the language that you know, we, we, as a species, have spent hundreds of thousands of years trying to develop. But it really isn't very efficient. It's not very, you know, the fidelity is not that great on text. Text is, uh, all things considered, a pretty inefficient way to move data from one place to another. I understand the irony of I'm literally speaking to you in text right now to try to convey information. Uh, but, but really, if I could just hand, the, if I could download what I knew about this subject into you in a second or two, like a thumb drive, you guys could already be at lunch eating lobster. The text is, but text is plentiful. There is a ton of text out there and available. Yelp comments. There are uh, millions of books that have been produced over time. There are articles that come out. You know, tens of thousands a minute uh, of articles hit in different uh, areas on the internet and, and elsewhere. There's also, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook and I mean, all of these. Everything that we do, the world effectively, uh, when people are involved, communicate in text. That's the way we communicate uh, with, with each other. That's the way we communicate with with the world is in text. And so being able to take this same thing and do in the scrub process, be able to find a way to represent text. This is a little outside of the scope, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. But be able to represent text in a systematic way um, so that I can now extract the meaning systematically, mathematically. I can represent it in a way that an algorithm can make sense of what I want to uh, get out of that text. This is a personal favorite. It's a, it's a huge up and coming area that, that you see not as often, but I think it is incredibly important. Uh, and it's one that a, a bunch of a, a very large, very successful sort of machine learning companies uh, uh, really put a lot of stock in because of what you can get from it are network graphs. So network graphs, uh, the easiest way, the canonical example that, that, to, to envision this is your Facebook account. You are a node. You are connected to a number of different things. You're connected to other people, other nodes that are people, uh, by being friends with them. You're connected to nodes that are events by maybe you're going to go to it. You're connected to nodes that are pictures because maybe you commented uh, on that picture. So you as a, as, a, as a node in this graph are connected to a number of other things, and those things are all connected back to you or to other places. And to figure out, um, how do I find out things about a network? I'm, I don't happen to be friends with a given person, but I'm friends with Brian, who's friends with Luke, who's friends with that person, and so I can get to that. Uh, that that's how that person and I are related through this pathway through the network. Or maybe we both commented on the, on the same thing. And so these network graphs and these ways of representing data as having fundamental connections to each other rather than just an order or just kind of a, a nice simple row and column type approach um, are an incredibly powerful way to represent data. And because of that, they tacitly become an incredibly powerful way uh, to fit machine learning problems into understanding. So, if, and, and, and let me give you a, maybe a supervised example. I understand. I, cre I take out this network graph data, and I look, and I see. Sorry. Uh, for those of you in the back who couldn't see, I got stuck in the tape. Um, I, uh, uh, I take this network graph data, and I maybe figure out, you know, if I get an event from somebody who is a friend, I'm X percent likely to go. If I get one that's a friend of a friend, I'm, I'm, I'm Y percent likely to go. If I get a, a request to go to an event from someone that I've been to an event before and I have commented on their photos and uh, you know, maybe we have uh, five, other connective, you know, five other people that we are both friends with, um, maybe I'm way more likely to go. And so given a new event, how likely am I to go? That's the question I want. How likely am I to go to that event? Take this exact same example. How likely am I to buy that car? How likely am I to go see that movie? How likely am I, as, as a person, to post that picture? And so that's, that's where we can start to frame, in this exact same way, data that doesn't fit kind of the, the sort of Microsoft Excel uh, model in our head. 
And the last one is visualization. So visualization is never talked about as a domain in machine learning. It's never talked about as a type of machine learning because it is not a type of machine learning. But it is sufficiently important and sufficiently useful. And it is something that I hope is of, of, of interest to the kind of domain that I, that I know is very interested in Thunder Plains that I want to consider it as though it is a part of machine learning. And I want to make the argument for why it should be. And the, the argument that I want to make is none of these models matter. None of what we find out about the world matters unless we can communicate it to other people or unless we can communicate it to something, whether other people, other machine learning processes. But ultimately, the only way that we create value is by communicating something to another person. The value has to come from the person eventually. And so data visualization is how it is kind of the primary way that we mix things like art and web programming and, and, and design into understanding these models. So fundamentally understanding the model. If the only reason that you fundamentally understand what these models are doing with the data and what generalizations they're making about the world rather than memorizations, then hopefully that will spark a creative note in how do I communicate what I found out about the world back to the world in which it came. And that is a sufficiently important uh, domain in being able to be effective with machine learning. I want to consider it just as if it's one of the domains. That's, I, I dearly love this quote. I don't even know if it belongs to a person. It belongs to Google as far as I'm concerned. You are not trying to learn about the data. You're trying to use the data to learn about the world. The, that, the, the, the field of machine learning is just one step in the cog of the thousands and thousands of cogs of the universe attempting to understand itself via us. And so whatever area in that that you play, if you, don't, if you, you, know, if, if you decide you really want to get started using machine learning, but you never literally code a line of a machine learning framework, you are still doing machine learning. You are still using the machine learning uh, tools. And so I, I don't you be scared. Machine learning is easy to be, you know, is, is an easy thing to think is super scary. Um, it is not. It is not remotely scary. There are uh, very few things that you can do wrong while you are, are, are learning. There's only things that just aren't quite as right as they could be. Uh, but, you, but there are very few things that you can literally do wrong. And so I, I really hope that, uh, you know, even if it's as easy as uh, plugging into the machine learning APIs that you can get from places like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, uh, that, that, that you fundamentally understand how to take a problem, frame it as a data science problem, frame it as a machine learning, ultimately a problem with a machine learning uh, model that could be its solution, that could tell you something about the world in which that data was created, uh, in which you would learn more about your application, about your website, about some aspect of, of a business project at work than you knew before you went in. Uh, ultimately, uh, learning about this, you're not going to learn everything from, from, from me, so I want to give you a place to learn even, even more. Unless everybody remembers this as, as kids. Uh, I love I could sing that song even. I, I think I'm singing it in my head right now. Okay. The three, uh, the, the, the three places, if you want to learn more about machine learning, particularly about really getting down and dirty into literally doing uh, these components of it, I am a massive, massive fan. You can read books. You can uh, listen to uh, like podcasts. You can watch YouTube videos. There's a ton of ways to learn this type of stuff and, and what are variations on the um, regular way, uh, you know, variations on kind of the historical way that the programming languages and frameworks and, and software concepts got taught. But... I am a massive, massive fan, as it sounded like a, a, the, the people that are on the panel right before me, of interactive education. Online interactive education is literally using machine learning to help more effectively teach you machine learning, to figure out how to give you the examples of what you're weak on and what you're strong on so that you ultimately are strong on all of the pieces of it. And uh, the three that, that kind of come up uh, the most often are edX, Udacity, and Coursera. There's several others. There's, uh, there, there, there's others that are uh, a little more niche into certain areas. I think Pluralsight's getting into that. I think uh, the Treehouse thing is, is getting into that. There's a ton of them out there. Most are good. A couple of crap, but most are good. So you got a pretty good chance of, you know, if, it, if it's one that enough people have heard of, it's probably good enough it's stuck around. Um, and so that, I think that is a really good way to, to get started in this area is you, you can't just learn these concepts by having them kind of come in your eyeballs. You have to uh, learn them by literally uh, uh, 
literally sitting down and whether it's typing the code or integrating the models or running them and see how good of a job uh, I did it do on the problem that I've already solved elsewhere. Uh, literally doing these things is, is, is what, like anything else, uh, ultimately gets you to learn about it. And so hopefully there's no fear uh, behind, well, it's just it's too hard for me to ever learn. It's, it's, it's way easier than you think. And, it's, and, and, and the trick is the intuition behind it, not the technology. Uh, behind it. So that's me. Uh, my name, again, is, is Frank Evans. Uh, I work uh, here in Oklahoma City locally for uh, Exaptive. We're a data science company over in Midtown. Um, we have a blog uh, that uh, I've done a bunch of machine learning projects uh, uh, on, and some of other people have, so it's a good place to kind of get ideas. You can always, you know, email us, and we'll give you the data, and you can rip off our ideas as, as a learning tool. If you liked these slides, I know Kristen did. She took six or eight pictures while I was up here, uh, and I was hoping they were the slides, not of me. I'm not, I'm not that good looking, so. Um, she took, uh, uh, if, if you want these slides, they're up on SlideShare, uh, so you're welcome to them. Most of them are pictures that I just pulled off of, of Google, um, but uh, uh, if you want these, want these slides, they uh, are up there, and that is it. Uh, Jesse, do we have... I don't think we have time for questions. We have time for one question that I can answer in three minutes, and then everybody gets lobster. <laughs> oh, yeah, we need the... I will use this. All right. So we hear him. Okay, I saw her first. Like, like Oprah out in the crowd. Okay. That's... I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't. I don't know if you did. Everybody hear that? Probably not. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think they got your microphone on. It. What? What? What she said was uh, there is a uh, there's a uh, there's a couple of kind of data science and machine learning oriented meetups, uh, both here in Oklahoma City and up in Tulsa, uh, that are fantastic. There's a I think it's called Data Science Tulsa or Data Science of Tulsa or something like that. That's up in Tulsa. Um, that a guy named Ben runs. It's fantastic. There's a big data and data science user group. Uh, here, they actually have a meeting today. You can't go to it because you're eating lobster with Jesse. But they have, there's one here in Oklahoma City uh, that's good. There's another one that's called Data Plus Creativity that my company happens to host, but we just like let you in the building. That's how we host it. Uh, that, um, uh, that, that, is, that is really good for uh, uh, learning about these areas and connecting with other people that you want to just kind of shoot the breeze about a data science concepts. So all you, sir. I think that's pretty much it on time. We're going to go up and do lunch. So thank you very much. I will say that if you liked that talk and you want a treat, Google Frank Evans gerrymandering. He's using uh, machine learning to solve a really important problem. So uh, just trust me on this one. Go check it out.